by Kevin Stewart on planning and inclusive growth. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Kevin Stewart. Minister, 10 minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Scotland's economy needs a world-class planning system. Uh, we need long-term planning to lay the foundations for inclusive growth and future infrastructure investment across Scotland. When planning is done well, we get high-quality developments, well-functioning communities and places we value. Planning in Scotland has had its successes, but there is room for improvement. It's crucial that planning is an active facilitator in the growth of our economy, particularly in light of challenges ahead of us. For example, this government is acutely aware of the particular threats to rural Scotland arising from Brexit and the importance of planning as an enabler of development in our rural communities. Planning needs a rethink if we are to realise its full potential as a driver for sustainable growth. Our planning system must take a strong and confident lead in securing the development of great places that will stand the test of time and help us adapt to long-term climate change. My first request to planning officials when I became minister was for a full report of the independent panel set up to review the operation of our planning system. The, this review was independent of government, not led by the development industry or the profession, but with a focus on the experience of those who use the planning system and whose places are shaped by planning decisions. The drivers for the planning review, delivery of housing, of infrastructure, the experience of our communities, the effectiveness of development planning and management, resources, skills and leadership were, I believe, the right areas to examine and they re remain the, the key areas for improvement. The government followed up the panel's work with extensive consultation and discussion with a wide range of stakeholders and heard many views from professionals, the development sector and businesses. And I was particularly pleased that many individuals and community organisations took the time to share their ideas. Bringing people together has not guaranteed consensus. However, we have listened to all views and I'm grateful to everyone who has engaged in the process to date. Planning is important to all of us and the system needs to work for all interests. Yesterday, the Scottish Government introduced the planning bill to this Parliament. And I wanted to take this opportunity, presiding officer, to update Parliament on how the bill will change how planning operates in Scotland and how our legislation is also supported by a wider programme to promote changes in approach and changes in attitude in planning. Our communities need investment in development. That's a good thing. It brings much needed housing and infrastructure and services we rely on, like schools. And it brings places for our services and places where we can enjoy our leisure time. And importantly, investment in planning and development brings much needed jobs too. This bill is about inclusive growth, about securing investment in all of our futures. And at a time when Brexit brings nothing but uncertainties, it's even more vital uh, that we support Scotland's economy. The planning bill sets out a strong legislative structure for a much more proactive and enabling planning system. It will bring us clearer development plans produced through collaboration without being stuck in process. Development plans need to provide clarity about where development should take place and how our places may change over time. They should help us to design and deliver places where people can lead healthier lives, move around easily and have access to their homes, services, facilities, education and the employment that they need. They should set out a vision for places which are low carbon and resilient to the future impacts of climate change. We should be focused on delivery rather than a continuous cycle of plan making. So we will simplify the development plan system. We propose to remove the current tier of strategic development plans and ensure that the national planning framework and local development plans provide effective coordination and delivery of the infrastructure we need to support development, including housing. The next national planning framework will provide a clear plan for Scotland as a place 
supporting the delivery of all of our policies on the environment, communities and the economy. It will play a central role in realising our climate change ambitions, setting the course for the planning system as a whole. We will empower people to play an active role in shaping the future of their places. The bill will ensure people in our communities have a real influence over the future development of their places through meaningful early involvement. We will draw a clear statutory link between community planning and spatial planning so that local development plans capture the aspirations of the community for better services and the develop development needed to support them. And we will give communities the opportunity to produce their own uh, plans, which may ultimately form part of the local development plan. We will ensure uh, that the planning system is properly resourced to lead. There's wide agreement that the planning service has been under-resourced and that is having an impact on performance. We can change the legislation and revise planning fees, but there needs to be a clear and related upturn in performance standards. The latest set of uh, official statistics on planning decisions uh, was published this morning. And while there has been some uh, moderate improvement in the pace of decision making in recent years, we need to be sure planning processes and application handling are as swift as is reasonable and add real value. Our bill aims to do this. The bill will include scope for additional discretionary charging to fund a better service. For example, a higher fee could be paid for faster decision making. We will also consult on further in increases to planning fees once the shape of the new planning system is clear. And that will be coupled with the bill's proposals for taking a stronger statutory approach to planning performance, assessment and improvement. Even now that the planning bill is before this parliament, we continue to listen to what people tell us. For example, I'm att attracted by the prospect of embedding the agent of change principle into our planning system so that we can protect the established and emerging talent in our music industry. Our live music venues should not become financially disadvantaged or have their viability threatened as a result of new development in their vicinity. And I understand the pressure in some parts of the country for new co controls over short-term short letting of residential properties. This particular issue is currently being looked at uh, by the Scottish Expert Advisory Panel on the Collaborative Economy. And the panel's report is expected shortly. We will continue to engage closely with our stakeholders in developing the best possible proposals. I'll be happy to bring forward amendments to the bill if that's the right thing to do, but only where there is a robust ev evidence base for doing so. I'm sure that members from across this chamber will share this government's aspirations for a well-functioning and effective planning system and the stakeholders we have engaged with. But I also accept that people can have some differing views on how we should go about that. For example, I fully acknowledge that there is some disagreement around rights of appeal. We agree entirely with the views of the independent panel on this, that better inclusion and co collaboration at the front end of the system will bring more positive results than pursuing further options for conflict and dispute resolution at the back end. Our bill does not include a third party right of appeal. That would run entirely counter to the thrust of the reforms to support inclusive growth and would introduce significant and unwarranted risks to our economy. But I'm equally certain of the need to uh, retain existing rights for applicants to appeal against decisions to refuse planning permission. As an illustration of why, since 2014, around 5,500 housing units have been approved on appeal those following refusals by planning authorities. If we're serious about growth, about securing investment and delivering the homes, jobs and economic growth that Scotland needs, then we cannot afford to put unnecessary obstacles in the way. I look forward to the discussions and the debates to come 
over the coming months and to us reforming and modernising Scotland's planning system so that it delivers on the investment in good quality development that our communities deserve and our economy needs. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we must move on to the next item of business. As usual, it would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question to press the request to speak buttons now and also made their questions succinct. I have 12 members wishing to ask questions. I call Graham Simpson, followed by Pauline McNeill. <coughs> Can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. The planning bill contains some positive steps which we would support, but I want to focus on some of the more draconian measures being proposed. For example, the proposed infrastructure levy could be retained by government, not councils. Why and on what grounds and why hasn't the government decided what sort of levy it wants? The bill would also order councils already cash-strapped to prepare annual performance reports <coughs> Will they be given extra money to do this? And quite separately, there's a power to send in a Scottish Government troubleshooter if a minister decides a council's planning department isn't performing and there could be fines for non-cooperation. The Scottish Government would even be able to take over a planning department. This runs a coach and horses through any pretense of localism. Can the minister say under what circumstances he would use this power grab and on what grounds he has brought forward these proposals. How does he de define underperformance? Because the bill certainly doesn't. What is the problem he is trying to fix? And finally, councillors would have to pass an exam to take planning decisions. This, this affects all councillors whose right to take those decisions is surely determined by the voters who elected them in the first place. Again, the Scottish Government reserves the right to take over if a council doesn't play ball. What's the justice for this effrontery to democracy? Minister. Presiding officer, within the uh, bill, there is the ability, as Mr. Uh, Simpson points out, uh, the provision for the int introduction of uh, an infrastructure levy um, through regulations. Um, however, that levy, levy itself uh, would be uh, spent uh, locally um, and not nationally. Uh, but beyond that, as I've already pointed out to Mr S Simpson previously um, in discussions that we've had, at this moment I do not feel uh, that we are in a position to knowledge knowledgeably uh, introduce that infrastructure levy. And that is why um, we will continue uh, to do work on that particular issue. Uh, I would draw attention, uh, members' attention to the recent uh, analysis that has been done, that's been posted uh, on the Scottish Government website on that issue. I have asked my officials to continue to work on that, and that will be uh, the case. Uh, in terms of performance reports uh, and uh, additional costs, as uh, Mr Simpson uh, asked, um, as I said in my statement, uh, I would look to um, uh, increasing uh, planning fees if we see movement in performance. I've already done so uh, since I took up post. Uh, I've made it quite clear that I want planning authorities to invest that money uh, in their planning services. Many authorities are doing that um, and we are seeing uh, much better performance in that regard. Uh, a number of the things which have come up uh, across my desk during the, the course of uh, being in post is round about performance. Uh, and there was provision in the 2006 Act uh, to look at performance much more closely and allow further uh, ministerial intervention if that was required. That is something that a uh, power that I would hope not to use, uh, but the reality is that if a situation occurs where an authority is not performing well, then we should have our options open. Uh, and Mr. Simpson's last point was uh, around about the training of councillors uh, and councillors uh, having to set an exam. Well, currently councillors and licensing board have to undergo statutory training and set an exam at the end of it. A number of people believe that that situation has led to improvement in terms of decision-making uh, around about licensing. Um, a lot of people 
um, are not uh, entirely happy with the current situation uh, around about, um, as they see it, a lack of training for elected members. The bill will allow for that training uh, and I do not see uh, what problem there would be in that um, because I think that that is the most important thing of all that decision makers understand the reasons why they're taking the decisions that they are. Polly McNeill followed by John Mason. The planning bill aims to give people a greater say in the future of their places and it aims to empower communities. But there is no redress in the bill for communities who feel a deep sense of unfairness that planning favours one side over the other. What remedies will communities have if they feel a decision is not appropriate or where the, where the development plan has actually been breached? There is no statutory, tangible or specific right of any kind in the proposed bill to challenge decisions in local communities. Will the Minister at least recognise that early engagement in the 2006 bill has not worked? Communities can produce a local place plan. How meaningful is that, I'd like to know. Will there be any resources allocated to achieve this, particularly for poor communities, and how will that be incorporated into the final development plan? The higher fees that are proposed for faster decisions, would that not create a hierarchy for richer applicants which will have an advantage where fees have already risen in the planning system? I ask the Minister, how does this sit with a quasi-judicial system which should be open and transparent? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. A number of questions there. And as I said in my statement, one of the things uh, which we want to see um, is much more communication and cooperation at the beginning of the process. Uh, Ms McNeill has heard me uh, speak before uh, about uh, linking um, community planning with spatial planning. And I think that we have the ability uh, to use local plans and join them up uh, with local outcome improvement plans to create better places. Already um, in some parts of the country, communities uh, have been uh, putting together their own local plans. Uh, that has happened recently in Linlithgow. Um, I haven't seen the plan myself, but I understand that that is a very good example of a community coming together and coming up with a very positive uh, local plan. Now, many communities uh, like Linlithgow will be able to do uh, those kind of things without uh, very much help. And I, I would encourage communities like that to do so uh, and for local authorities to cooperate with these communities. But Ms McNeill uh, is right to point out uh, that some other communities uh, may have a little bit more difficulty in putting together uh, those plans. And that is where I would expect uh, local authorities uh, to give more help uh, to those uh, socially excluded communities uh, that may face those difficulties. And I don't think that that resource is going to be a, a huge amount, to be honest with you, because community planning should be already taking place in these places, and that intertwining should bring uh, these uh, services uh, together. I think that in terms of faster decision-making, uh, we will look very closely um, at what is uh, required in that regard. Uh, we know uh, that in many places, in many parts of the country, the decision-making process is very, very slow. Um, I continue uh, to keep a very close eye on statistics, including the statistics this morning. And it's not just all about timescale, it has to be said. It's also about quality. But beyond that, uh, we have got to reach a point where the system itself, where planners become enablers uh, and deliverers rather than people who are just going to say yes or no. If the reason is no, uh, there has to be reasons uh, for that uh, and maybe the opportunity should arise to say, look, if, if you were to change this, uh, it may make your plan much more viable. So much more cooperation. Uh, much more communication. I agree that in terms of the 2006 Act, uh, the early engagement has not worked as well as folk hoped. But I think we have got a huge opportunity with new technology to get folk much more involved in, pl in planning. And that's why alongside this, I continue to work with the digital uh, task force that I put in place uh, to make sure that we can use that to engage people at an early stage.
Now, I've obviously allowed leeway for the first two leading questions, but I now have 10 people wanting to ask questions. So can I have short questions, please, and succinct answers, if I may respectfully ask that of your minister. John Mason, to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Uh, on the one hand, we want economic development, we want more homes and other services, but on the other hand, we want the local community to have a real say. Does the Minister believe it is actually possible to get a balance between that that will really satisfy everybody? Minister? Um, President Officer, I do believe that our reforms aim to strengthen uh, planning's contribution to inclusive economic growth, uh, delivery of the development that we need, and to empower communities. Uh, and we need uh, an effective planning system that helps create quality places with the housing infrastructure and investment uh, that current and future generations need. Uh, giving people a greater say in how their areas de will develop in the future, uh, I think is central uh, to our reforms of the planning system. Uh, and for example, as I've already said to Ms McNeil, that link to, uh, from the, to the local outcomes and improvement plans to the new local place plans offer uh, a huge amount of opportunity for communities and will help uh, communities uh, meet their aspirations. Beyond that, uh, this bill, of course, uh, will help us achieve um, our ambition of 50,000 affordable homes during the course of this parliament. And no matter where I go in Scotland, since I've taken up this post, uh, I get the, the call, we need more housing here. We've got to get this right for communities. I think this bill will do that. I think I'm going to have to redefine succinct. Dean Lockhart, followed by Andy Whiteman, please. Thank you. Can I ask the minister? In his statement, he acknowledged the planning service has been under-resourced and this has had an impact on performance. If this is the case, why has this government not acted sooner to address this underperformance? And what additional support and financial resources will this government make available to address this underperformance going forward? Minister. Uh, as I pointed out in my earlier answer, um, presiding officer, uh, earlier on this year, I allowed uh, for the rise in uh, planning fees. That is more resource going into local authorities. Years. And I would expect local authorities to use that resource wisely uh, and to invest in their planning services. Andy Whiteman, followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. I welcome the bill. Can I remind the Minister that the independent review did not include any questions on rights of appeal and, and that discussions on that topic were banned in stakeholder workshops. Does the Minister accept that if we were to have a more meaningful upfront engagement in the system, that it's illogical and counterproductive to deny the need to equalise appeal rights? And does he accept that retaining existing rights for applicants to appeal will inevitably, in some cases, overturn, frustrate and erode trust in the very community engagement and local accountability that he seeks Minister. to promote in the bill? Uh, presiding officer, I said uh, earlier on that the independent panel um, uh, did not support um, a third party right of appeal. Um, we do not uh, propose to remove applicants' right to appeal against planning application decisions. What we do want to see, without a doubt, is that early engagement right at the beginning, rather than conflict at the very end of the process. Uh, and uh, many folks have given examples of third party right of appeal in Ireland, for example. We have seen a, a situation in Ireland where things have changed dramatically. There are now special development zones uh, being put in place where third party right of appeal is not allowed to allow for the investment that is required. And beyond that, there is much more judicial review uh, in Ireland than there is here um, in Scotland. I think that the key in all of this is getting it right at the beginning rather than conflict at the end. Alec Cole Hamilton followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister whether the planning bill will do more to protect areas of greenbelt and natural heritage like the Camo Estate in my constituency, particularly when development on such areas would lead to intolerable pressure on local roads infrastructure and local health services? Minister. Uh, Mr Cole Hamilton is being a bit naughty by uh, talking about a particular place and he knows uh, that I will not respond about a particular place uh, in my role as planning minister. It is up to each local authority uh, to put together its local development plan, taking into account uh, the needs uh, of uh, the community uh, that it ser uh, serves. Um, it is not for me uh, to say exactly what they should be doing in those regards. It is up to them to put those policies in place. However, the other thing about local development plans is uh, the requirement uh, 
uh, to meet the housing need of a particular area. Uh, what I would say is that in recent times, Edinburgh uh, has failed to meet that need with its new uh, local development plan, uh, being some 7,500 houses short. Uh, we need uh, to see improvement in that regard. And I think this is another reason why uh, we require the training of elected members so that they know exactly what they're doing uh, when they're putting together uh, local development plans. Uh, and also, uh, of course, they should be taking cognizance of the communities uh, that they serve. Fulton McGregor, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it intends to strengthen the planning system's contribution to inclusive growth and growing the economy, and what the Minister thinks that <clears throat> um, how, how local sorry, excuse my voice, how local communities as a whole will be able to affect um, the, the plans when it comes to large scale developments. Minister. Um, President officer, the bill itself will ensure that planners uh, move from uh, regulating development to making things happen. We have a system at this moment in time where a local development plan uh, is completed and planners uh, immediately move on to the formulation of the next local development plan, which doesn't actually provide any uh, security for communities. And beyond that, at the moment, doesn't allow for development. We want to see that development uh, go forward that will give much more uh, confidence in that development actually uh, being completed. Uh, the bill uh, will look at, at uh, making sure that there's a much more consistent approach uh, to performance. Um, and of course, all of this uh, has to be done with communities who will have a stronger say um, and influence and in, in positive changes happening to their places. The local plans are extremely important. That interlinking between local plans and community planning, I think, is all important. And that's what I want to see right across the country. Thank you. Lewis MacDonald, followed by Ruth McGuire. I welcome the Minister's reference to Agent of Change, which he will know is set to be taken forward to protect live music venues in Wales and in Greater London. If amendments are brought forward to add Agent of Change to the provisions of the planning bill in this Parliament, Will they have his government support? Minister. Um, I welcome uh, Mr. MacDonald's uh, discussions with me on this issue. I welcome uh, the discussions of uh, Mr. Uh, Arthur, Tom Arthur, to uh, the Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop and from the industry itself. Um, I think that uh, we all know that there have been difficulties in certain places uh, around about live music venues, and I think. Uh, that we have to uh, do all that we possibly can uh, to ensure uh, that we protect uh, this vital part of our heritage. Um, we, as a government, are aware of proposals that have been put forward uh, by Wales who are dealing with us through their planning policy uh, rather than through legislation. I'm also aware um, that the Mayor of London is uh, looking at the agent of change principle for the next London plan. Uh, and of course, um, in, the, in the state of Victoria and Australia, their planning policy uh, has something similar uh, in that regard. Now, um, as Mr. MacDonald is aware in terms of the discussions I've had with him, um, I don't know if this necessarily requires primary legislation. It may be changes to Scottish planning policy that are required. However, whatever change is required, uh, he can be assured uh, that I will be positive uh, around about this issue. Ruth McGuire, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you. To ask the Minister how he sees the planning bill as a key way of contributing to the delivery of much-needed affordable homes and, indeed, infrastructure in Ayrshire and throughout Scotland. Minister. Um, Presiding officer, uh, the chamber will be absolutely sick to the back teeth of me talking about housing constantly. It is absolutely essential uh, that this bill um, moves us forward in terms of our affordable housing delivery targets, whether that be in uh, Ms. Maguire's patch in Ayrshire or any other part of the country. Um, it is uh, everywhere I go, um, I, I get we need more housing here. Uh, and we need to get on with the job of providing those warm, affordable homes for people right across Scotland. This uh, bill 
uh, will allow uh, for that to happen. Uh, we will be able to see areas which can be zoned for housing uh, with permission granted up front. Uh, and of course, uh, what we also must ensure is that we get the infrastructure and investment right uh, as we build those homes across the country. Alexander Stewart, followed by Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister confirm that local place plans prepared by local community bodies will not be undermined by Scottish Ministers and detail the support that we provided to these community bodies to ensure successful outcomes? Minister. Um, I've already uh, given my view about local plans, which currently have uh, no statutory place. Uh, I think that uh, places and people and the likes of Lynn Lithgow who have come up with us uh, their own plans there are to be applauded. I am certainly not going to undermine anybody's plans. Um, what I would say is there may be uh, occasions where uh, communities and others have to agree to disagree, um, but I would encourage communities the length and breadth of Scotland uh, to get involved in spatial planning and community planning. I've gone to great lengths uh, since taking over this role uh, to try and encourage people uh, to become involved in planning. In particular, I want to see more young folk involved in planning. Uh, and there's been a great success in your own constituency, presiding officer in Gala Shields at Gala uh, Academy, uh, where pupils there, uh, along with PASS, are learning about the place standard. They have got somewhat different ideas um, from older folk. All of those ideas need to come into the mix and I hope that young folk will get involved in local planning. I thank you for the name check. I'll call Claire Hockey, and if you're brief and the Minister's brief, I can squeeze in Jenny Goldruth, the last questioner. Claire Hockey, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it intends to encourage stronger engagement with communities and people earlier in the planning process, rather than at the end, to ensure the system works for all, including those who want to invest in the quality of our places and our economy. Minister. Um, I know that uh, Ms Hockey has taken a great interest in this and particularly um, in Cambus Lang, if I remember rightly, um, in terms of engagement that she's had with me. I want communities like those in Cambus Lang uh, to have early engagement uh, around about the plans uh, for their places. Uh, and I, the bill itself encourages that. Uh, and I think uh, the local planning aspect will give communities like Cambus Lang a great opportunity to shape their communities. Jenny Gilruth, briefly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister explain what an inclusive growth approach will mean for Scotland's poorest areas and will he ensure that the new planning process will adequately engage and empower local communities? Minister. Absolutely. I want to see communities the length and breadth of Scotland uh, engaged uh, and empowered. In particular, um, uh, as I said uh, in my answer to Ms McNeill, I want local authorities to put emphasis on helping socially excluded communities uh, to fulfil their ambitions in terms of uh, local place planning and community planning. Uh, and uh, as a government, we will continue uh, to do all that we can in terms of uh, community capacity building to make sure that these communities uh, have the same abilities as others that are a bit wealthier. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister and members? I managed to get all questioners in, thanks to the Minister being succinct. Uh, that concludes questions on the statement. I'll allow a brief suspension before we move on to the next item of business.